to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live. We are in Ottawa, Ontario, home of the two-time defending National Women's Curling Champions. That's right, the Rachel Holman rink that curls out of the Ottawa Curling Club here in downtown Ottawa. And if you're listening to this on February 11th, which is when we're posting the show, the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts kicks off on Saturday, which will be immediately followed by the Tim Hortons Briar, which is the Men's National Curling Championship. And with these two major events coming up, we thought it'd be a chance to look at curling in Canada and, and the meaning of the sport. And over the past year, I've had the opportunity to go to three different national championships the Mixed National Championships, which were held here in Ottawa at the Rideau Curling Club. Uh, I went to the 2014 Scotties Tournament of Hearts, which was held in Montreal, and then the 2014 Mixed Doubles Curling Championship, which was also hosted here in Ottawa at the Hunt Club. And at those events, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of players and get their feelings on curling, the state of curling, uh, not just right now in Canada and moving forward, but also its significance in Canadian culture. So this episode is going to be structured a little differently from the way we normally do things. So instead of you know having one or two guests and having a longer form conversation, we're going to delve into some of the themes that emerged while I was talking to some of the players as we explore curling's place in Canadian culture. And in exploring Canada's connection to curling, I think these national curling events championships tell us a lot about what curling is and and there's a different energy to curling events than there are to really any other sport there's uh, definitely a more congenial atmosphere particularly amongst the players who tend to socialize with each other and and tend to be much more available to fans uh, than certainly professional sports but also amongst the crowd there there's a, a friendliness to it i mean if you've ever been to a professional sporting event, you've probably seen at least one fight in the crowd. But I've never seen one at a curling event, and I can't imagine really ever seeing one. And, and there really is this a very friendly atmosphere that goes along with it. So one of the things I wanted to ask the players was, what does it mean to you to be at one of these, these events? And what's significant to you personally? And one of my favorite answers came from Rod McDonald, who was skipping the... PEI entry at the 2014 Mixed National Championships, and he has represented PEI at the Briar uh, on a number of occasions, and here's what he had to say. Well, it's always fun to come to a mix. It's, it's not really uh, quite as quite as serious as going to a Briar or something like that, so it's uh, all the all the teams are great. Uh, you know, they're friendly. And that PEI team was actually one of the most experienced at the Mixed Nationals last year as Rod McDonald's third was Kathy O'Rourke, who had actually won the event back in 1989. And she has been to the Scotties Tournament of Hearts six times, losing a rather memorable championship final in 2010. So she has a lot of experience at the national level. And here's what she said when I asked her if it was still fun to go to a national event after all those years. Yeah, no question. I mean, it, it is a, it's a great thing to be able to play in the national championship. Uh, you know, and that's what I love about the, the game of curling is, is it is a true national championship when all the teams get to play. And, you know, as you can see out here... Um, Anybody can beat anybody, and I mean, if you if you put your, you know, if you play a well, a really well game, you can, you know, you can win out here. And and just in general, what, what do you think curling means to, to Canada, and, and, and what's its place in the culture? Do you think? Well, there's no question. It, it has a, a place in the culture, and and I know just uh, from playing in the Scotties, it's, it's amazing to me how many Canadians watch curling. Um, it's, uh, I just, you know, when you play uh, on, on the televised games, you, you do get an indication of who's watching by who you talk to after, and uh, it, uh, it soon become, becomes apparent that even there's a lot of people that don't play our game, have never played our game, but love to watch our game. And that notion of television actually came up a lot when I was talking to the players, and th- they believe that this idea of accessibility that goes along with the television coverage is a really big factor in explaining why curling is so popular 
in Canada. And this is how Sherry Anderson, who plays third for Saskatchewan champion Stephanie Lawn, explained it. Well, you know what? I always think that it's a little bit physical. It's, it's a lot strategic, mm-hmm. uh, tactical. And the people in television, regardless of whether they're 10 years old and just starting up curling or they're 95, they see our faces, they hear our right. thoughts. Um, it's not like football where they have a big mask on or some of these sports where you could walk down the street and never recognize the player. Okay. They feel they know us, so regardless of um, whether they've ever met you in person, they come up with, oh, I know you, Sherry, I've watched you for years. And so I think that's a lot of it. There's a big appeal to that, you know, to be able to feel like I know that person. And for as good as the television coverage is and has been for the sport, one of the things that you notice if you ever go to a live curling event that is being televised is that the cameras are somewhat obtrusive. I mean, a curling sheet isn't that wide. And if you have a cameraman on the side of a sheet with a big high-def camera in your face, you would think that that would be kind of distracting. Uh, But I was surprised that none of the curlers who I talked to thought that they were distracting. Uh, And actually, Heather Strong, who this year will be her 12th appearance at the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts. This is how she described the television coverage. The cameras, I don't mind. The microphones, you have to kind of watch the language a little more, maybe. But, um, but no, it's fun. It's, it's nice to know that people back home are able to see you sometimes. Well, of course, between Heather Strong and Kathy O'Rourke and Sherry Anderson, they have a combined approximately 400 appearances in national championships. So those are the sorts of things that they would be used to. So it was interesting for me to get the perspective of some of the younger players as well, and in particular the rookies at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts. And here is Kessa Van Osh, who skipped the British Columbia entry in the 2014 Scotties Tournament of Hearts, who is 22 years old. It's been great. I mean, we love it. All the volunteers are doing a fabulous job of putting it on. So we're really, really enjoying the event. It's a completely different than anything else we've played before, but we're really, really enjoying it. And of course... At these events, everyone's goal is to win and represent Canada at the World Championships. And, of course, at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, there is a Team Canada entry, and that will actually be new in the Briar this year, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But representing Team Canada at a national event carries a little bit more weight. And this is how Lisa Weagle, the lead for Rachel Holman's team, described playing as Team Canada at the Scotties. You know, we feel so fortunate that we're able to play with the Maple Leaf on our backs. And, you know, we love playing at the Scotties, and we're so, so happy to be here. And, uh, you know, we're representing our province, and we're also representing uh, Team Canada. So it's a really neat feeling. Does it it ever maybe get get monotonous at times, coming to something like this? No, 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 I love it. Um, I have a day job as well. So, you know, I feel, like, really lucky to be here, and I try and just feel so... I'm fortunate and embrace every moment while I'm here. And as I mentioned, Team Canada will be coming to the Briar this year, which is actually kind of an interesting story. Last year's champion, which was Kevin Cooey, he left his team to join uh, another team with uh, Mark Kennedy and Ben Ebert, who used to play with Kevin Martin, and Brent Lang, who used to be- play with Glenn Howard. So th- he couldn't be... Team Canada and the other three players on his team had kind of committed to not playing this year, but because they won the Briar last year and couldn't get that automatic entry, they brought in John Morris to skip their team and they will be there as Team Canada. But one of the offshoots of this is that the Canadian Curling Association still only wanted to have 12 teams in the main draw. It's just easier that way. The logistics of it, the television situation just works very well with 12 teams but if you add team canada to the briar and the idea was also to add northern ontario to the scotties to make both championships even that leads to 13 teams and they also wanted to give each territory its own entry into the event uh, as previously the territories were represented by one team now each territory has the opportunity to send their own representative Therefore, there would be 14 provincial champions, provincial or territorial champions, because that includes Northern Ontario, and then Team Canada. So 15 teams that would be eligible to participate in these national championships, but only room for 12. And that has led to the CCA adopting 
a relegation round. Now, this Canadian Curling Association would actually tell you it's pre-qualifying, but let's be honest, it's relegation. How it works is that the teams with the worst records the next year get relegated and have to play off against the teams that did not qualify for the main event to make it in to the draw. So this year, for example, at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, the uh, UConn representative, which is Sarah Colton, who represented the territories last year, the Northwest Territories representative, which is Kerry Galusha, who has represented the territories a number of times at this event, and the Northern Ontario representative, which is Tracy Horgan, who has represented Ontario in the past. Those three teams have to play off over three draws. They'll play a round robin against each other. The top two teams will move forward to a qualification game, which will take place during draw one of the main draw of the Scotties, and that team will be entered into the final 12 teams. So out of those three skips, those three teams, all of whom have been to the Scotties before, two of them will not be able to participate in the main draw. And this decision by the Canadian Curling Association to relegate teams has led to some very mixed reactions. And a majority of the reactions that I got from the players was that people did not like it. They felt it went against the spirit of the sport. And one of the strongest reactions that I heard was from Stephen Moss, who represented the Northwest Territories at the Mixed National Championships, who actually lost the Northwest Territories final this past Sunday to Jamie Cooey in an extra end. And here's what he had to say about relegation. I hate it. I hated it right when they first started talking about it. I, you know, I see a real opportunity for all the provinces and territories to play. And uh, two years ago when they did the first one in Sudbury, they had all 14 teams. And I thought it was awesome. I, uh, I'd love to see it go back to that. And there's so many complications with uh, organizing your time. When you come down, you don't know whether you're staying and that. So... Uh, I think it's I think it's a negative thing. I'd rather see them go back to all 14 teams in there, and uh, I think that's the general feel of all the players. Now, when he refers to the 14 teams, the National Mixed Championship does not have a Team Canada entry. So in the past, what they did was have all 14 teams there, and similar to the model used at the Junior National Championships, in which all 14 provincial and territorial representatives get to play and they are divided into two pools of seven and each team plays a six game round robin within their pool and then you determine the playoff entrance that way and and that's the model that he's referring to and that's actually what the canadian curling association did this year for the mixed national championships which was held in north bay ontario they went back to that 14 team model to allow all the teams to participate for the full week but That model will not be coming into the Briar and the Scotties, at least not now, maybe in the future, but the CCA seems intent on keeping a 12-team field. So that's what Stephen Moss was referring to when he was talking about 14 teams. And when he says at the end, too, that you know he thinks all the players would agree, at the mixed championships, all the players did agree. Nobody argued for relegation. Nobody thought it was a good way to go. And in particular, it was Ed Saddleberger who skipped Nunavut's entry in the Mixed National Championships. He played in the relegation round, did not make it out of the relegation round, but did the hang around Ottawa for the week, did some sightseeing, and also took in a lot of the games at the Mixed National Championships. Here were his thoughts on relegation. You only come down and you only get to play two games out of, uh, out of a week, and uh, you're really just starting to warm up. Right. I think it's... Uh, you're holding the Canadian Championship. Hold the Canadian Championship. Yeah, and that notion of, you know, if you're going to hold the National Championship, hold the National Championship, was a common refrain from a lot of players who were concerned that this relegation system would hurt the sport at the grassroots level and would have people from provinces who may not make it into the main draw, therefore may not be on TV, that it could hurt the growth of the sport in those provinces. And this is how Rod McDonald laid it out. Uh, I hate it, really. <laughs> I guess I guess my view is on it, Sean, is that uh, right now there's getting to be nothing for the average curler to play in. Uh, if they can't play Dominion, they can. So I guess my view is they should make a briar into an amateur event, uh, have the winner of the Players' Championship go to the world to just make a briar an amateur event or a little more amateur event than what's on now. Uh, most teams... 
aren't aren't going to compete at that level unless you're uh, almost like a pro curler, and that's what those teams are. So. And perhaps the most passionate defense for including all the teams in the national championship came from Kim Dolan, who was the skip of the Prince Edward Island entry into the 2014 Scotties Tournament of Hearts. And she has been to the Scotties Tournament of Hearts 12 different times. And here is her explanation for why she supports keeping all teams in the main draw. I don't have a problem with the other teams coming into the championship. I do believe that it should be uh, a national championship. And, and I mean, they're trying that for three days out of the whole nine days that we're here. Um, I fully believe that at any given time, any team is capable of, of winning. And I believe that everyone should have that chance across Canada. I believe that young people coming into this game need to have uh, a goal to to meet, and I believe that they need that opportunity to keep the game growing throughout Canada. When you start to separate things from people and from teams, I believe that we're into and could have a little bit of trouble in that area. Um, I think uh, being able to go to a national championship for a young team is a goal that, you know, that's what they head out to when they're playing in all their junior championships. And I really have a hard time getting my head around why the changes and why not. Um, if we have to do something, let's let everybody play, maybe go down to eight end games, maybe cut out another couple things that we do in the championship. But I feel there's time to get everything in. And when you separate, I really don't believe in separation. So my honest and true feeling, especially in women's curling. I think women's curling is very close. Um, you know, somebody came up with the idea, you know, let's segregate, you know, the top teams. Well, you you play to play those top teams, and I really believe that you should have that opportunity. And I can't believe that costs of uh, to fly teams in, then fly them out at you know high rates, and just who's going home, and to see the faces on people to going home from a championship would be heartbreaking for a host committee, and from you know that standpoint, even from and a curler standpoint, I think is just not with this game what I remember this game being, and, it, and so my heart is not for it. Not only because you know we have you know the province has a chance to be in it, but in my heart of heart of curling for a long time, I don't believe in it. Did that put, do you feel any more pressure now? Oh, sure. It's been on the back of my mind for, you know, this whole championship. Um, you know, when we've had really close games, you know, a couple extra ends lost in, you know, final rocks, you know. And so, I, you know, I feel for those young people coming up that they don't get the chance maybe to, to be here and play all the teams. Was it unfair to, like, uh, one rink have a bad week and the next year's team has to, to deal with it. Well, that's that's my heart, you know, like that's the hard thing about being here. I know there's younger teens at home, I, you know, speaking only for myself, not for my team, but for myself. And I, and I know that they're, you know, the pressure, you know, not only on me, but, you know, to have to come and think that, oh, gosh, next year, you know, I might get to play two or three games and I may not be in the, you know, Canadian Women's Championship. You know, how heartbreaking is that? You know, I, 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 that is what I don't believe in. I don't believe in that we can go in a direction of pulling people out from this game. That's my my heart feeling. Are you concerned for the future of competitive curling in a small province like PEI? Sure, yeah. yes. Yeah, I, I see it right now. I see that, you know, we have lots of juniors, but I see the growth of curling at a standstill. Mm -hmm. And in a small province like ours and... I, you know, I, I think every little bit of, of um, well, being at championships or that drives, you know, kids to play and, and young people to play. And so I think there's got to be something and for them to have a goal to achieve. And, uh, you know, you want people in the game. You want people to, uh, you know, go out and do their best to try to get. You know, who wouldn't want to come to the Scotties? I mean, you're, you know, you're treated and you're... You know, you meet people, and, and uh, 
you know, the, the girls that you're playing against, you know, who wouldn't want to do that? But we have to have it be able to, you know, to, to reach it and to meet everyone and, and that. So, you know, um, I don't believe in it myself. Uh, I guess, you know, that's pretty plain to hear. Um, <laughs> Uh, and not just because I'm from a small province and all that. It, it could be anybody out there having a bad week. You know, it could be. And, you know, and uh, I'm not sure, you know, what the what the answers are, but I don't believe that you segregate um, and uh, pull people out from a championship. And you also had Alison Ross, who has represented Quebec the past couple of years at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts. She won't be there this year. Lauren Mann is representing Quebec. But Allison Ross was there as the host team this year, and her her rank struggled. And she openly admitted that having that relegation system is something that was on her mind through the week. And she was rather blunt in her assessment of what relegation could do to curling in the province of Quebec. I've thought about it for sure. Uh, I personally hate it. I think it's a horrible system. Um, not to... <laughs> So I never wanted a full answer. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a horrible system. I don't think that the territories need three teams. I don't think there needs to be a Northern Ontario team. Um, I think if we're going to give another spot to another province, there's provinces like Manitoba and Alberta. Like, I don't know why Ontario would warrant a second team more than another province that has a lot of curlers in it also. I understand the geography of it, but if you go by per capita curlers, I I just don't think it makes sense. Do you think it'll take away from the event not having uh, two provinces represented? I don't think it takes away from the event. I think it could still be a really great event. I think it just really sucks to win a provincial and not get to compete at a national championship. I think that's I think that's going to really suck for a couple of teams. And uh, you know, I hope that people still want to participate. I hope that people that there'll still be good provincial championships. I mean, we have a hard time in Quebec getting eight teams to come out to a provincial. I don't know if they they're not even sure to make it to a, a national if they're going to be interested in coming out to a provincial. So I think it's kind of killing it a bit. Of course, not everybody opposed relegation, and there were some people who felt as though it would actually improve the overall level of play at these events, as some of the weaker teams would not be in the main draw. And one of the first people who I heard speak out about it was Chelsea Carey, who represented Manitoba at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts last year. She has since moved to Alberta and actually lost the Alberta final this year to uh, our gal Val Sweeting, and, uh, who, who we are big fans of here in the Ottawa area. But last year was her first year at the Scotties, and here was her explanation for why she actually supports the CCA's decision to relegate certain teams. I think if they're going to add all those teams, that's the only way they could do it. I mean, you can't have this be like a 17-team event that just gets ridiculous. I mean, it's already a long week. So I'm glad that they're not adding teams, like the total number of teams to this event itself. It's a tough one because they're going to come, and but they get a chance to come. And I mean, that's so that's... I, I, don't, I don't love it, but I get it. I mean, I... I Personally, prefer, I know why they're doing Team Canada. I mean, I know why they've done it, the Scotties, for years. As a curler, I, I don't really like it that much. I think it would be better if it was just the provinces. But from I'm a, I have a marketing degree. And from a business standpoint, that's the only way. I mean, it's so good for the organizing committee. It gives you a face to everything. And, and it's just it's the, the only way to make... And at the end of the day, the business side is pretty important because we want, we want to grow the sport. So as a curler, yeah... No, I don't know, but uh, from that side, I think it's I think it's good. So I'm glad they're adding it to um, the Briar. Northern Ontario, I've never been a huge fan of, but I get it. It's geographically, it's difficult for them. Um, but you know, I'd argue that there's parts of Manitoba and, and stuff that they face the same problem. So I, I don't really, I've never really loved that one. But I think it's good that they're making the Briar and the Scotties the same. I think that's important, and you know, give everybody a chance. And so the relegation, I mean, that's what they do in in Europe. The Europeans are like that here and at the Worlds that they finish bottom couple. They have to requalify. I mean, the U.S. men had to requalify for the Olympics this year, so it makes sense. I mean, it's a model that's been used a lot. So I mean, it's it's tough for teams to come all the way down, especially if they're coming from Nunavut or whatever, to come all the way down for a couple days and then have to leave. But you know, that's the nature of the beast. I've heard Allison Ross say though that it might kill curling in Quebec. I mean. It- the incentive to get to the Scotties is sort of gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, right. fair enough. But you know, try to play the tour a little bit and and get a little better and improve and like don't make the Scotties the only thing. 
right. you know like you, you don't have to finish you don't have to be making the playoffs you just have to be you know getting out of the bottom four kind of thing so I, I understand where she's coming from but you know in Quebec they have a little bit of a tour and they're not too far from Ontario so it, you know maybe consider going to a spiel or two that kind of thing I don't know I mean it's easy for me to say because well and we fly to everything too it's not like everybody thinks oh you guys are in the west you don't we play one spiel in Winnipeg we fly to everything so I get it I know it's expensive I mean we've been doing it for years so I I fully understand that part but uh, but yeah it it probably will be a little tough for that but if you really want it you can still do it you can still get there so just get there and it's this last point that Chelsea Carey makes that's really been used by supporters of the relegation system in their arguments in favor of relegating teams. And basically it's that, you know, if you don't want to be relegated, just be better. And one of the biggest voices in the sport right now is Earl Morris, of course, father of uh, Olympic world champion John Morris and the longtime coach of the Rachel Holman team. And here were his thoughts on relegation. Um, I think that the change is a positive. I think that anytime you can put better teams on TV... That's going to have a better impact on your sport. Uh, you still have the opportunity, no matter what province you're in, to come back. If you're going to blame us for you're not playing well and being in last place, you need to work harder at your programs at that level. And maybe the compromise is that we start reorganizing ourselves regionally rather than provincially and say, okay, we're going to send so many teams per region mm-hmm. you know if you have a whatever four regions and then you do that that, that works for me too but I, I can only see positives mm-hmm. except that right now it's a little uh, awkward in terms of the logistics of it mm-hmm. I'm not sure the logistics are figured out yet but the concept is sound it's going to make for better briars with more really good teams because there's a lot of the games here that are not that interesting to watch, not that interesting to play. Mm-hmm. It's a reminder to us in the have-not regions of the country that we have to work harder at having good coaching mm-hmm. so the teams can do better. You know, It's back to curling. Curling needs to say, we got to do more to make our young players really good, mm-hmm. and we don't do that well enough yet. And that idea of breaking up the country regionally rather than provincially is really interesting because when you look at the results of a lot of competitions, particularly the senior competitions. The juniors tend to be a little more open than, say, the Scotties or the Briar. But generally speaking, those senior events, it's the same provinces over and over again doing well. There are obviously exceptions, but generally speaking, provinces like Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario tend to be at the top of the standings. Uh, In the women's play, at least, Saskatchewan always does really or tends to do really well. Uh, not so much in the men's play. So you have these these pockets of the country where curling is huge, which leads to greater opportunities. You, Rod McDonald alluded to this, that teams from the East Coast don't have the opportunity to play a lot of high-level events because a lot of those events are based in uh, the prairies or Ontario and Quebec. So the, the, the logistics of getting your high-level teams to major events is is very, very difficult. Now, probably the biggest exception to this is the Brad Gushu team, which plays out of Newfoundland. And they have been successful for a long period of time playing out of Newfoundland. But they also have the funding to do so. And and here's Rod McDonald talking about the logistics of the Gushu team and some of the obstacles that they've overcome. Certainly. I mean, uh, you look at Brad Gushu's team, and imagine this budget must be... Seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars. I mean, you know, it's unless you have a terrific sponsor, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. So, do you think that has a negative effect on, on curling on the East Coast, or at least competitive curling on the East Coast? I would say yes. Yeah, um, I know the cash bills on, on the East Coast have really dropped over the last few years, and teams are really dropping. Even the small cash bills we have are not filling now. So it's uh, it's you know curling. I, I, five years time, I don't know where it's going to be, but it's not going to be in good shape. I don't think. So clearly Rod McDonald is not overly optimistic about the future of curling, or at least competitive curling, on the East Coast. But I did talk with Adam Casey, who the past few years had played with Brad Gushu. He was his second, uh, no longer with the team as Mark Nichols, who won the Olympic gold medal in 2006 with Brad Gushu, moved back to Newfoundland from Manitoba. And in that shuffle, Adam Casey was the odd man out. But I did talk with Adam Casey, who was playing at the mixed doubles event in Ottawa about the challenges of 
putting together a competitive curling team on the East Coast. I think, uh, they need to do more with the junior programs. I think Rocks and Rings is doing something to get in. I think I think you're slightly incorrect in saying that there's only two teams. There's a few women's okay. teams that are fairly competitive out there, and like okay. we put a lot more in the other men's team. But there's some there's some talent out there at the same time. But uh, yeah, like I think the numbers have been dying. Like it wasn't that long ago they're getting 30, 40 teams out for provincials, and I think they still have a really competitive senior. So. Mm. I think they just need to do more to get young people into the sport. Now, of course, the flip side of having provinces where there are low expectations and great difficulties for elite curlers is that you have provinces where a lot is expected. And I think one of the first provinces that comes to mind when people think of curling in Canada is Saskatchewan. I know personally uh, I have a soft spot for Saskatchewan from my time at the University of Regina. And actually here in Ottawa there is a Saskatchewan Mafia Curling League that, that plays Sunday mornings, which I've been part of for the past three or four years. So when a Saskatchewan team shows up at a national event, there are some major expectations, which is very much the opposite of the expectation for East Coast teams. So I talked with Stephanie Lawton, who will be representing Saskatchewan at the Scotties for the fourth time this year. I, I talked to her about the pressures associated with representing Saskatchewan at a national championship. No added pressure at all. I, I, we actually really enjoy the support that we get from back home, and uh, we certainly appreciate it. So um, to have you know the province behind you and, and kind of there with you, even though they're not all here, we, yeah. we certainly appreciate that, and we, we thrive on having that. What would it mean to, uh, to, to win a national championship being from Saskatchewan and just how important the sport is there? Oh, it would be huge for us. We, that's, that's our goal. That's what we're working towards. And, yeah, it would mean a lot to us to do that. For as much as Stephanie Lawton says that the team's goal is to win a national championship, ultimately the introduction of curling into the Olympics has fundamentally changed the sport. And you've seen this Over the past year, the number of teams that have changed after the past Olympic cycle trying to get to Sochi and now teams gearing up for the 2018 Olympics in Korea, the rhythm of the sport has really changed and all the curlers have their mind on the Olympic Games. And that leads us back to the issue of funding and the difficulties that East Coast teams are having. But there's also an issue now of elite teams having to compete with curlers from other countries who are professional curlers. The model in Canada is that you have amateur, at least semi-amateur curlers who go to national events, win the right to represent the country. In a lot of other countries, Olympic associations or sport associations are funding teams to be the national team. So those players have the opportunity to play full-time, and you've seen a leveling of the playing field at a lot of international events, in particular at World Championships, where it is no longer a given that Canada will win. I mean, Canada has done very well at the Olympic Games, but the, the balance of power has started to shift. And this comes back to funding, and the question as to whether or not Canada should follow this model and whether or not Canada should have full-time curlers that would be funded by the Canadian Curling Association, the Canadian Olympic Committee, Sport Canada, whomever. And Chelsea Carey actually had to quit her job last year to dedicate enough time to go to the Olympic trials. Uh, She was not successful. Jennifer Jones won the Olympic trials and went to Sochi. But Chelsea Carey addressed this issue of having curlers who have to work full-time jobs in order to live and whether or not this model could be successful in a world where other countries are paying full-time curlers. Well, it's difficult. I don't know where the money comes from. I mean, that's what the rest of the world is doing. That's what we're competing against as professional curlers from the other countries, and they wonder why, you know, the world's coming on. Well, that's why. But there's so much depth in Canada that how do you do that? It's just, it's... It, we're in a bit of a purgatory right now, kind of stuck in between, and I don't know where it's going. It's, it's going to be interesting to see because there's just too many good teams in Canada to give all your money to one or two teams, but that's what the other countries are doing, and so then how do we keep up with it when they're professional curlers and we're not? So we're, we're caught in the middle, but we're getting, I mean, we're getting a lot more help than we ever did. We're getting some funding from Sport Canada and, and Own the Podium and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, my dad marvels all the time at what we get that he never got when he was playing. But when he was playing, it wasn't as big a time commitment. It wasn't as professional. I mean, that's all come on in the last 10 years or so. so. And while the introduction of curling to the Olympics has added this new dynamic to the sport, it has also given rise to a new version of the game, and that would be the mixed doubles which the World Curling Federation and the Canadian Curling Association hopes will be part of the Olympic program in 2018. And if you're not familiar with mixed doubles, 
instead of four players, obviously it's only two, one of each gender. And rather than each team throwing eight stones, each team throws five. There are two stones in play at the start of the end. And it really is a different version of the sport. They've added this to the Continental Cup for the past few years. And a lot of curling clubs are starting to adopt this and have mixed doubles nights. And it really is a new version of the sport that the idea is that for the World Curling Federation, countries that have difficulty fielding four-person teams would have an easier time putting together mixed doubles team because obviously you need fewer players. So at the national level, the mixed doubles event is getting more and more attention. And last year at the event here in Ottawa, some of the top players in the country participated, a lot of whom cited the possible introduction of mixed doubles to the Olympics as a motivation for playing. And and I had the opportunity to talk to John Morris, who won an Olympic gold medal with Kevin Martin in 2010 in Vancouver. Here's what he had to say about playing mixed doubles and the possibility of mixed doubles in the Olympic Games. To be honest, I have more fun doing this than regular curling. This is more uh, the reason why I started curling. It's social, Mm -hmm. it's active, uh, you got to be fit to play it. Uh, it's a very aggressive curling, a wide range of shots. It's quicker than a normal curling game, so you don't get as bored out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just, I, I love it, I, I, and I'm a big advocate of it. And uh, it's, it's really big in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't see it in Canada very much, mm-hmm. but it's starting to gain momentum here in Canada. And uh, uh, I believe that it's going to be in the 2018 Olympics. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, I wouldn't, you know, that's why I want to get into it, so I can. You know, really get the strategy down and the, the game down before uh, you know the Olympics in three years. So. How much do you think the Olympics, uh, currently in the Olympics, has changed the sport? Um, I mean, you've been there, and then this year there was a, the with your move, there was sort of a lot of talk about that, and, and maybe the Olympics maybe having a negative effect on the sport, at least at some maybe some of the lower levels. Uh, I don't think it's. I think what it, all it does is it, it's separated a bit of the. It's been a bit of a tier system now, so that you have uh, you have your legit curling's just gotten better. So, uh, you know, I don't think you can say it's ruined the sport. You know, the fact that curlers are getting better and they're more a- athletic, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, we still, you know, I'm still a curler at heart. I still go up in the lounge and have a cold one after the game, but that's just because that's the way I learned how to curl, right? And, and that, I'll never forget that tradition, those traditions of the game. But, you know, the fact that curlers are getting better and they're getting more athletic, I can't see that as being a bad thing. I, I just think that there's... Uh, you know, people, some people when they curl, they have goals of making the Olympics. And some people when they curl, they have goals of winning the Friday Night Mixed League. And some people when they curl, they just want to come out and have a, it's a fun excuse to have a beer on uh, during the weekend. So it's, uh, you know, everyone has different goals for, for you know, getting into the sport. And, and uh, I think they're all good. For as much as the Olympics has changed the sport, John Morris does touch on something very important there. And that curling is ultimately a social game. And, and you see that even at the elite ranks. And at the mixed nationals in particular, there were several husband and wife teams there. You also had uh, Marcel and Sylvie Robichaud, brother and sister there. So so that social, that family element was definitely there. Of course, that can lead to tension sometimes. And here's Debbie Moss talking about the team dynamic of playing with your spouse. I think sometimes he gets frustrated. When he does get frustrated, of course, he vents to me, (laughs) which is good. I think, you know, that's good for him. Um, We play well together. I don't know. I I think we're in the right positions playing together. I don't know if it it would work so well if I was in the the house with him, Mm -hmm. but it works really well, our our situation. So Debbie is right in pointing out that it's a little easier when you're not in the house together. But what happens when the third and the skip are related to each other and that was the situation last year at the mixed nationals on team new brunswick which was skipped by sylvie robuchot who is actually the only female skip in the event and is actually representing new brunswick this year at the scotties tournament of hearts where she had her brother marcel playing third so that created a different dynamic on that team than existed on any other team So first we'll hear from Sylvie about that, and then her brother Marcel, talking about what it was like to play with a sibling at a mixed national event. (laughs) Well, it's, you know, having your brother right beside you, so sometimes you just uh, not necessarily get along, but we, me and my brother are pretty close, so we get along pretty well, so it's not a a big deal for us. We learned how to, we've curled uh, five or six seasons together now, and uh, we we know how to curl each other. We know what to say. 
Ultimately, though, for as much as curling is a social sport and for as much as the Olympics has brought new attention to the game, there are concerns within the curling community that the sport is not growing at a rate which will ensure its long-term survival. And part of that is because there lacks a certain diversity in curling. And part of this can be explained by the fact that the game has never really been marketed to new Canadians in urban settings. Therefore, when you go somewhere like Toronto, there isn't a particularly strong curling community. And Earl Morris has talked about this and his concerns over the long-term survival of the sport in an increasingly diversified country. You know, I think that curling has always been very significant to Canadian culture, certainly in the past and specifically in the western part of the country and the prairies with the Scots bringing it all over and the Scottish farmers introducing it and the Ukrainians, for example, in uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan embracing it as a sport that they really like. But uh, we're at a risk of losing that relevance uh, if we don't start uh, working harder at reaching the new Canadians that are here that don't have that in their background. Uh, Because we have hotbeds of curling around the country, but you take a look at Quebec, for example, and it has not, uh, curling hasn't advanced, it hasn't gotten bigger. The irony for curling is there's 8 million people that like to watch curling on TV and about 1 million of those curl. So there's 7 million people out there that like what we do. So we've got to find ways of reaching those people and we've got to find ways of reaching new Canadians. And of course it's easier to reach new Canadians in urban centres because there are immigration centres that are specifically there to help new Canadians become Canadianized. And I think new Canadians are anxious to take on Canadian life and Canadian sports as opposed to hanging around in their own community. I think lots of them would love to embrace that. So we have to find a way of doing that better than we do right now because we don't like to use the word we're a white sport, but we are a white sport, and that's not healthy. So, and, and of course, we are, you know, we're in business against the other folks who are in hockey and in bowling and skiing that are trying to convince people to play their sport, what we got to do, I think, continue to work at doing a better job than we do. Do you have any thoughts on how to to do that? Absolutely, yeah. First of all, um, you know, we've started in the last three or four years to do something called Getting Started Programs Mm -hmm. for Curling, where we take new people and we introduce them to curling and they're introduced with other people who are brand new beginners and all they do for the whole season is they uh, practice and do drills and play a little bit of curling against each other. And so I'm a strong believer that people uh, gravitate towards things that they get good at. Mm -hmm. And in the past, we would give you a two-hour clinic, come on out and try curling, we'll put you on a team with a skip from hell, and at the end of the year, you'd never come back. So now we do this much better, and so that's really been an important step. And, and across the country, people are trying those programs and they're working, so that's good. But I think in urban centers, we need to be uh, looking at uh, the immigration centers that are there and doing some sort of business plan with them where we collaborate and, uh, and become uh, invite folks in to, to curl. Uh, it'll work in the urban centers where there's lots of new Canadians, um, but it won't be easy. Because then you go to battle, well, they don't have transportation, uh, they don't have extra money and so on. So we have to make it really easy for new Canadians to play so then they can take the messages back to their communities and say, hey, I tried curling, this is a really good sport. And then we break down those barriers that are there where people uh, have never tried it before and are afraid to try it because it looks scary or it looks strange. And I know from my experience, at least anecdotally, that Earl Morris is right when he says curling is very much a white sport. When you go to a curling club, there generally isn't a lot of diversity there. And it's one of the obstacles that I believe is facing the sport and something that in terms of growing the game over the next 10, 15, 20 years is something that's going to have to be addressed. And it's something that I discussed with Marianne Arsenault, who won five Canadian championships playing with Colleen Jones. I guess um, 
the, there are more, there's more diversity in the younger players. Um, I think as kids have their friends from different areas of life, um, you know, then as they grow up, then their kids will play and so on and so on. And that greater diversity in the junior ranks is one of the goals of the Rocks and Rings program, which is introduced by the Canadian Curling Association. And it takes curling into schools and introduces young people to the game. And if you watch curling on television, Rocks and Rings commercials come up very frequently. And the demographics of the kids in those commercials tend to not necessarily reflect the demographics that you'll see at a Wednesday night league in a curling club across the country. And you, and it's clear what the goal of this program is. It's not just to get kids in the sport, but to get people who had not been exposed to the sport previously into the game. And w- the main spokesperson in these commercials is Caitlin Laws, who, of course, throws the third zone for Jennifer Jones and won the Olympic gold medal in Sochi in 2014. So I asked her about the Rocks and Rings program and the effort to diversify the sport. Well, the, the Rocks and Rings is great because it goes into schools all across Canada. Mm-hmm. And so kids that may not have had the opportunity to even know what curling is or try curling are getting to try it in their gym class. And they're kind of picking up on what the sport's about and mm-hmm. hopefully sparking an interest in, for them to actually take that next step and go to the curling clubs and give it a try on the ice. And so I, I think it's it's neat that we can able they're able to go into the schools and give that option uh, without having to take everyone out of school and go into the curling club. Do you think we have a diversity problem in the sport? It's hard to say. I mean, it's it's whoever's interested in playing it, right? It's I don't know if it's a problem. Uh, I think it's just more so uh, the culture uh, of Canadians, and some people like it, some people don't. So I mean, I hope everyone gets a chance to try it. And I know everyone that I've taken out for the first time. They say it's harder than it looks, but they had a lot of fun. So that's the neat thing. That's a social sport. You can play it at any level. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next 10, 15, 20 years with respect to curling and the efforts of the Canadian Curling Association to diversify the sport and to grow the game in a changing Canada. Ultimately, though, the core aspects of the sport have remained the same, and that is having fun, being social, and there is something to curling that is uniquely Canadian and something that I really believe all Canadians can attach themselves to. And there's a spirit to the sport that is really different from any other game that I've ever seen or been involved with. And you could really see that last year with Darren Molding, whose Alberta rink won the Canadian Mixed Championships. And here were his comments after winning the championship game against Team Ontario. Uh, that's what I've uh, thrown practice rocks and dreamt of since I was about 12 years old. I've uh, probably thrown 10,000 practice stones pretending I was going to win the Canadian championship. So for as much as there are serious issues facing curling in Canada, whether it be relegation, funding, issues over the competitiveness of teams across the country, issues with diversity, The Canadian Curling Association ultimately hopes that that spirit, that that joy that comes from the game that is expressed by Darren Walding is enough to propel the sport forward in the years to come. And the sport is healthy in a lot of ways. Rogers Sportsnet has announced that they are expanding the Grand Slam from currently there's five events. Next year they're going to, I believe, seven and then eventually up to eight. And that goes along with TSN. It expanded its skins game this year. It's added the Canada Cup to its season of champions. So really, I mean, in a couple of years, you'll pretty much have a curling event on TV every weekend, it seems. So in that respect, it is popular. But at the same time, as Earl Morris pointed out, 8 million people watch on television, but only about a million people play. And there are issues at the club level getting people out. Numbers are down at certain clubs across the country. And ultimately, that could hurt the sport. So there are these issues at play. So this idea of curling being a national sport, really being representative of Canadian culture, that could be at risk in the coming years, given all these issues. 
So I hope you've enjoyed our little foray into the world of curling. My thanks to the Canadian Curling Association for providing me access to these events and the opportunity to speak to the curlers. And my thanks to all the curlers. Vic Router says this at the end of every event, but it really is true that curlers are very generous with their time. So my thanks to them. If you have any questions or comments for the podcast, it's History Slam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.